Communism has a long, rich history of oppressing its people, impoverishing them, and ultimately killing them. This is the first in a series of segments on notable communist catastrophes, The Great Leap Forward. China 1949. After an on and off 20 year civil war, the Chinese Communist Party emerges victorious as the nationalists retreat to Taiwan and after a brief period of unpleasantness, create a burgeoning, mostly free society that has become the envy and the obsession of the Chinese Communist Party who would very much like to turn it into the next Hong Kong. But back to 1949, oh, happy day. The communists now have an open field to implement their utopian vision and usher in an unprecedented period of happiness and prosperity for the Chinese people. There's a brief honeymoon period between China and the USSR and dreams of a Soviet Sino alliance, but they do not last long as the new Soviet premier, Nikita Khrushchev, has the audacity to denounce the genocide of his predecessor, Stalin. You see, the premier of the Chinese party, Mao Zedong, views Stalin as well, basically a nice guy with good intentions. Where have I heard that before? Anyway, this little difference of opinion creates a rift between the two future communist utopias. China decides to break from the Soviet Union model and create its own communist ideal. Now, Mao's first initiative under this new model is dubbed the Great Leap Forward. Who would have thought that anyone could come up with a plan even worse than the Soviets? Anyway, step number one in realizing the Chinese communist ideal is, of course, take everything. The Korean War slows things down a bit, but by 1955, the confiscation of private property is well underway and the hit parade of stupid programs really gets moving. But, but first, it's important in any totalitarian regime to crush dissent. Mao gives a speech where he says, among other things, let 100 flowers bloom. Let 100 schools of thought contend. People are thrilled. They start sharing their contending thoughts on Mao's plans, both good and bad, in an effort to participate in the creation of utopia. Mao is also thrilled. He now knows who his enemies are. Hundreds of thousands are re-educated, which means for many of them, learning what it means not to be alive. On to the next step. At this time in China, many live in the countryside and work on small, basically family farms that produce food and sell it at market. Well, no more of that. All private property is effectively abolished from land and produce down to homes and tools. Every rural farmer in China is forced into communes and the fruits of their labor are sent directly to the cities or to Moscow in exchange for factory equipment. Now, Mao has set impossibly high production quotas for rural farming. But since the penalty for missing your quotas is death, everyone reports that they are meeting their quotas even as food production falls further and further behind. People begin to starve. This happens relatively quickly, and by 1958, the disastrous consequences of the Great Leap Forward are already becoming apparent. In true totalitarian fashion, when the results of their disastrous policies become too obvious to ignore, they need to find a good scapegoat. In this case, it was a very small scapegoat and one that could not talk back. The sparrow. <laughs> Mao's theory was that since sparrows eat food, they all need to be killed so people could have more food. It's almost like listening to the theories of a small child. What could go wrong, right? Oh, well, never mind the fact that people burned up many more calories chasing the sparrows around than the sparrows were actually consuming. Mother Nature, shocker, actually did have a reason for the sparrows to be there. Namely, eating the bugs that the following year devastated the Chinese grain harvest, causing even more famine. Eventually, China ends up buying hundreds of of thousands of sparrows from Russia in order to replace the ones they killed shortly before. While all this is going on, Mao somehow manages 
to outdo himself in the stupidity department by requiring rural farmers to, in essence, build their own miniature metal factories in an effort to supplement lagging urban factory production. The, the number of things this guy does not know could easily fill an encyclopedia, but since pointing that out is a guaranteed death sentence, the bad decisions just continue to snowball. Metallurgy is a surprisingly, at least to Mao, complicated undertaking. The metal that the peasants are producing in their miniature factories is essentially worthless. And it takes effort away from the small amounts of food that they're able to produce and creating an inescapable spiral of death for tens of millions of Chinese. Now, when it became evident the population was falling due to starvation, Mao had the statistics destroyed. Nevertheless, the results of the Great Leap Forward are so quick and so devastating that the program is effectively halted by 1961. But it's the gift that just keeps on giving. In 1975, dams built with the help of Soviet experts collapsed, resulting in another quarter million deaths. Today's Communist Party still idolizes Mao, much like Mao idolized Stalin. Kind of tough to do based on the actual history, so a fake history, complete with fake historical accounts, is required. Honestly, grisly though it is, this is communism at its very best. Create an alternative reality where nothing is true except when the state says so.